Welcome once again. I'm glad that we can do this each week. The Appleton Community Evangelical Free Church sermon video. And we uh, love to be able to provide this for those that are watching. Uh, like I say, I hear from some that attend our church that are watching it, others that don't attend the church that are watching, and we appreciate just the privilege that God gives us to be able to teach God, His Word to uh, to people. And, and as I acknowledge that, I realize I can't do this without His strength, without His help, without His provision. And that's why I begin with prayer each week. And um, we're continuing looking at the topic of prayer. Today we're going to be looking at God's kingdom. And, you know, as we pray for God's kingdom, why do we do that? That's one of the things we'll consider. But before we do that, let's take a moment and speak to our Father in heaven and ask him to guide this time as we share God's word together. Father, I thank you. I praise you for your absolute perfect goodness. I realize as I get started in this this, this afternoon, I pray that um, we acknowledge your greatness and your goodness. I, I realize that uh, I don't measure up in any fashion, Father, and I need your help in all aspects of what I'm doing here today. I need your help and be able to think clearly through this. I need your help and to be able to communicate appropriately through this. I need your help, Father, to be able to say the things you want me to say and to express the things you want me to express. And I do ask that you'd use this uh, presentation to bring glory to yourself. And I realize, again, I'm not capable of bringing glory to you, Father, without your strengthening, without your help, without your provision, without the leading of your Holy Spirit. And I just express that, and I clearly realize, Father, I need you. I know everyone that listens to this, they need your help and strength, too, in any number of ways, not just in hearing a message, but in all the things they do. So I pray your blessing over those that are out there today, Father. I pray for special needs around our church. There are some individuals that are facing medical needs, and I bring them before you. There are some individuals that are facing end-of-life decisions right now, as uh, there are some uh, people being put on hospice. And I recognize, Father, that in your timing, you always work things out in the perfect way. We don't always see it as clearly as we should or could, but I know, Father, you're in charge, and I pray for these matters. I pray for these people. I pray for our staff, uh, for Ruth, for Roberta, for Lisa. Thank you for the work they do in children's ministry, in the office, in, this, in, the, in the office in finances. I pray for Pastor Blake. This weekend they're on a retreat with the young people. I pray that you'll use that time away with, with uh, uh, this time, Father, that this will be a blessing to all those that attend. There may be some that come to faith in Christ. There may be others that make greater commitments, and I pray for that. I pray your touch on those things. I ask again, Father, that I can think clearly through this and, and communicate clearly, guard my mind and my mouth in all of that. And I do pray for any concerns that are represented around our society, around our world, around the globe. I realize there's so much going on, so many difficulties, so many challenges, so many things that are, are fearful to people. And Father, I commit it all to you because I know you are fully in charge and I do trust you. I don't always understand, but I trust you and I thank you. And now I ask that you'd uh, help through this time, Father. Bless and guide and use this to bring glory, honor, and strength uh, to those. Glory and honor to yourself and strength to those that are listening, Father, I pray in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Right. Okay. Did you ever stop and wonder what it would be like to live in a perfect world where everything is absolutely perfect? You know, I, I realize that as we think of that, for us, that's heaven. And um, as a, for instance, I prayed a little bit ago, the, the aunt that I've mentioned a couple times recently, my 104-year-old aunt, godly prayer warrior, I found out just uh, this morning that uh, she's been put on hospice. And uh, apparently she's maybe looking at end-of-life circumstances right now. At 104 years old, her life's been long. She's been a prayer warrior, and she's going to experience the perfection of heaven. And it's going to be absolutely glorif glorifying. I mean, it's, it's wonderful. Something that's amazing. But you know, Donna and I had a friend a few years ago 
She was a close friend of some other people that we knew quite well, and she became our friend, and uh, she came to our church occasionally, and at one point in time, uh, we were asked to be able to sit down and talk with her. She wanted us to talk to her about our faith and about some things that uh, would maybe be helpful to her. And as we expressed to her the gospel, we told her about Jesus Christ died on the cross, paid the penalty for her sins, took her penalty, and that uh, she can trust in him and be forgiven of her sins and be guaranteed to go to heaven. And we asked her, now, do you desire heaven? Is that something you desire? And she looked at us and she says, well, I guess I'm supposed to, but you know what? I kind of like it here on earth. I like the life that I have, and I'm satisfied with that, so therefore, I don't even think about heaven. And as I remember that statement that she made, we went on and asked more about the gospel to her, or to exp explain more about the gospel to her, and she really wasn't interested. She wasn't looking so much toward heaven as what she could have been or should have been. And as I express that, you know, I think, how many people really don't look forward to the perfections that they're going to experience? Or how many people don't even realize what God's kingdom is going to be like? Where it says in Isaiah that the lion and the lamb will lay next to each other and they will not be threatened. The lion will not be threatening the lamb. The lamb will be perfectly content to be next to the lion. And we're told about that in God's kingdom. We're told that, that all tears are wiped away, that everything will be absolutely according to God's will in a perfect manner. And as we realize that, we say, whoa, that's not what things are like here on earth. And today we're looking at, in the Lord's Prayer, that phrase where Jesus said, Our Father in heaven, may your name be honored as holy, and then may your kingdom come. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And as we say that, do we understand what we're praying? Do we understand what that's all about? What do we think about when we consider God's kingdom? What thoughts go through our mind? And I realize that God's kingdom is something that is confusing to many, many people. There are, dis there are differences of opinion from different individuals that look at God's word, and they draw different conclusions, they draw different opinions. I personally think that some of the things that they draw, some of the ideas they come up with about the kingdom, that they are misguided, that they are, they are misunderstanding what's actually in the scriptures. In fact, I believe some people start in the wrong thesis. They start with the wrong foundation. They don't understand what it all means when it talks about God's kingdom. They don't realize that God's kingdom is eternal. Psalm 145.13 says, Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and your sovereign rule extends throughout all generations. God's kingdom is forever. It started with creation, and it extends forever and ever and ever. And His sovereign rule, it, it's, it's never thwarted. Reminded in, in Job, where it says in Job 42, that God's will will never be thwarted. And God's will will always take place. But the thing is, as we look at what happens in the world today, we realize there's some things that don't seem to be like God's will. And I wonder about that sometimes. I wonder, well, why are some things this way? And why is sin so prevalent over there? Or why are some of these difficulties so oppressive to these different people? And I realize that that is... Part of God's plan, yes. But that's not part of God's perfect will. But yet God tells us that he orchestrates all things to work together for what's best for those who? Who love him, for those that are called to his purposes. And that's all people that are believers. And there are people in this world who never experience God's perfect will for their own lives. They experience God's will in the sense that they're going to be chastised, they're going to be condemned in some fashions, because they've never trusted in Christ. But we need to realize that there's a certain way in which God's kingdom, how it affects our lives and what it means to us, so therefore, what we want to do is we want to start today by looking at various ideas that uh, summarize, various truths from God's Word that summarize what is involved in God's kingdom program. 
There are one, two, three, four, five different ideas that I want to communicate here regarding God's kingdom program. And, and as I say that, a simple summary of God's kingdom program. And I want us to understand this. This is kind of a foundation for us to understand so we get to the second portion of the message that is going to describe and define the idea that we pray your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Why do we pray those things? What's the purpose in that? What's the meaning behind that? But first, the foundation. Because a simple summary of God's kingdom program says, number one, the kingdom of God was established in Genesis 1 and 2. When God created the world, when it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. God established his kingdom. His everlasting kingdom began with that. The moment he created. Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God created. And he went through the six days of creation, then rested on the seventh day. And the kingdom of God was therefore established. It was started in Genesis 1 and 2. And we see in that that God's sovereign authority was demonstrated in creation. God spoke and it was made. God had absolute control. God was capable of speaking and things would come into being. He created out of nothing except his word. And he created. His sovereign authority was established in the process of creation. He went all the way down the line as he created the heavens and the earth as he created the, the plants and the sea and, the, and all the various things. He, play, he created the animals and then mankind. And God's sovereign control, his sovereign authority was demonstrated in creation. God created Adam. Number one, he created Adam. Then he created Eve later, yes. When he created Adam, he saw that it wasn't good for man to be alone. So he created a helpmate for him. But yet, when God created Adam, he created Adam to be his image bearer. It says, God created man, God created man and woman, God created them in his own image. And we who are created in God's image, we are called to be God's image bearers. Adam was God's first image bearer, and he was our representative. He was our representative, and when he sinned, his sin was carried over to us. And therefore, every person born, actually, Adam and Eve were created, and after that, every other person was born through the birthing process, and every person that was born except for Jesus Christ was born as a sinner. But yet, God created Adam as his image bearer. And that's significant because God wants his, his, his reputation to be extended and expanded by his people. And we're going to look at some of that as we go through today. We saw last week where we talked about our Father in heaven. The only people that truly have a heavenly Father are those who have trusted in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Other people, they are imaged, they are created in the image of God. They're created by God, yes. They are not full-fledged children of God, though, because they've never trusted in Jesus Christ. And we're going to see that here in a few moments as we look further into the whole creative plan, or the actually the, the kingdom plan that we're looking at right now. But number you know, second, the third portion of this first part, the kingdom of God was established in Genesis 1 and 2. God commanded Adam to eat freely from any tree except one. Any tree is yours. It's free. It's yours. It's yours to eat. It's yours to enjoy except for the one tree. And that was a command. God created Adam to be his image bearer. And as the image bearer, Adam was to obey God's instructions, God's commands. God commanded Adam to eat freely from any tree except for one. Now we know a problem came up. Because the kingdom of God then, Genesis 1 and 2, was established. In Genesis chapter 3, the kingdom of God was tarnished. The kingdom of God was tarnished. The earth was, was cursed by man's sin. 
And God says, this, is, this brings a curse upon the creation. And what we find in that is that Adam and Eve failed to follow God's command. They ate from the forbidden fruit. They ate from the forbidden fruit. And God says, if you eat from the fruit, you will surely die. They didn't die on the spot, but death came into being when, in fact, they ate from the fruit. And we face the possibilities. I mentioned my Aunt Lil that is maybe facing end-of-life issues now. She will pass away. She's, follow she's a follower of Jesus Christ. She loves her Lord and Savior. I know she's headed for heaven. But death came because they ate the forbidden fruit, so the kingdom of God was tarnished. But then we also see all of God's creation fell under the devastating effects of the fall. Everything in this world is a victim, so to speak, of the devastating results of the sinfulness of mankind. And that's a factor of this life. That's a factor of where we live today. That is one of the reasons why this message is so important. We need to understand God's kingdom authority is important. God has the right to rule. God has established a kingdom, and he is going to fulfill all he said he would do through his kingdom rule and reign. And because God is king, he has that, that authority, he can send a savior, Jesus Christ, to be the one that would rescue us from the devastating results of the curse. Because of God's authority, because of God's power, because of God's might. But yet that's done all because the kingdom of God was tarnished and there's a need for that. But thirdly, we see a restored kingdom of God was promised in the last portions of Genesis 3, beginning with verse 15, and all the way through the rest of the Old Testament, all through Malachi, God's restored kingdom was promised. It was promised over and over and over again. And it was promised not in a way that changes what God was planning to do necessarily, but it was affected, the, 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 the revelation of the kingdom was affected by the various things that took place throughout the Old Testament days. God knew it before it was going to happen. God had a perfect plan in place. But a restored kingdom of God was promised in Genesis 3 through Malachi, through the rest of the Old Testament. And what we find is God initiated his plan. He initiated his plan to reverse the curse. And he was going to reverse the curse by sending a Savior. Did the Israelites understand what was that all about? In fact, if we would go into the details, we'd see where God got upset with mankind because he told them to be fruitful and multiply and spread out. But they camped out near the Tower of Babel. They built the Tower of Babel, and then God, he determined that can't happen. He, he scattered them. Prior to that, in Genesis chapter 6, God sent the flood because he saw that mankind was going absolutely against his guidelines, against what he desired. And he sent the flood, and he saved through, Mo, through Noah. He saved through Noah. But we see that other things God promised to Abraham, I'm going to make from you a nation that will bless the entire world. And from that nation will come one that will be a blessing to all mankind. And God promised that. God promised that the Israelites actually would go into the uh, slavery in Egypt and that he would rescue them through Moses. God sent Saul to be the first king, so to speak. He was the first king of Israel. Before that, we have the judges. We're going to look at that in a few moments or in a little while and consider the fact that in those days in Israel, there was no king. And every person did what was right in his own eyes or her, their own eyes. And it says that the sons of Israel, that they, um, that they did evil in the sight of the Lord. And, and we realize that. That happened in the Judges. And, and we see all the way through that, that God was working toward sending a Savior, and he worked through all the different events, all the different things that happened. And we see a kingdom program building and, de and, and developing through that time. And finally then, 
we see God's kingdom program was expanded. How? In the ministry of Jesus Christ. His kingdom program was expanded in the ministry of Jesus Christ. Uh, we, we find that. Now, what I want to say be, before that, though, in, in the last point, I miss saying this. I realize, in fact, download the notes off the church website and you'll get these things and you can see them more clearly. I've decided not to use cards all the time. I'm using a card, one card today in the applications, and that's it. But a restored kingdom of God was promised through Genesis 3 to Malachi. And God prom God's promises led to the chosen nation of Israel. I said that in that time frame a little bit ago. But then what we find is the Old Testament, Genesis through Malachi, provides for us a foundation for God's kingdom. A foundation for God's kingdom. Promise after promise after promise. Jesus, the Messiah, will sit on the throne of David. That was promised in 2 Samuel chapter 7. That the Messiah will sit on the throne. And we see that. And through Isaiah, we see the suffering servant, the promise of a Messiah that would suffer and die on the cross. He'd be ridiculed, he'd be persecuted, but he would die on the cross. We see through Daniel... God's promises of kingdom after kingdom after kingdom. And the Old Testament provides for us a foundation for God's kingdom. And as I said a moment ago, God's kingdom program was expanded in the ministry of Jesus. The New Testament reveals the fulfillment of God's kingdom. Old Testament, the foundation for God's kingdom. The New Testament, the fulfillment for God's kingdom. Jesus was identified as the king, and yet he died as a, sin, as a sin sacrifice. He died as a sin sacrifice who died as the substitute for all who will trust in him. Jesus, he was identified as king. Was he crowned king? Was he initiated as king? No, he wasn't. Similar to what King David in the Old Testament, David was, was anointed to be king in, in 1 Samuel chapter 16. He was anointed to be king there in 1 Samuel 16, but he did not become king for several years after that. Fifteen years after that, before, before David became king, he had a wait, a waiting period. Jesus Christ was identified as king. He will not officially take the throne of king, the throne in Israel, until the second coming, the second coming of Christ, which is described in Revelation 19 and 20. And Jesus promised to return to rescue his followers from God's wrath toward those who reject him. That's the rapture. Jesus promised to return to rescue those of us who have trusted in Christ, whether we're dead or alive, whether we're in the grave or whether we're still alive, we'll be rescued from the wrath that is coming upon the world because we'll be given resurrected bodies, glorified bodies. We'll be taken to heaven to be with Christ. John 14 describes that. 1 Thessalonians 4, 1 Thessalonians 5 describe that as well. And Jesus promised to return to rescue his followers from the wrath that God is going to execute upon the world because there are people that reject God's authority. But then finally, God's kingdom program will be fulfilled in Revelation. Fully fulfilled in Revelation. God will restore Israel and keep his promise of their kingdom. Jesus will take the throne of David as promised in 2 Samuel. God's eternal kingdom will result from Jesus' reign as king. Jesus will reign for a thousand years. There'll be a brief break in that, in that time of, of, of activity. Satan will be loosed. He'll be, he'll be captured and, and, and subdued completely, locked up during the thousand year reign. After that thousand year reign, he'll be loosed for a while. And then after that, Jesus will take over and will basically, he'll, um, he'll, he'll commit Satan and all the, the devilish angels and all that. The devilish angels, I said, he'll commit all of them to the lake of fire. And then 
we're going to have the eternal kingdom and Jesus will reign in the new Jerusalem. And that's all important. That's foundational. That's a summary of the kingdom program. It's a very quick summary. I hope you grab the notes and look them over because that will be helpful because I know I said this very quickly. But it's important for us to realize that God's kingdom program is something that he wants us to desire. It's something he wants us to understand as best we can. Deuteronomy 29.29 The things that God has revealed to us, they belong to us and our sons and daughters forever. God wants us to know those things and take hold of those things he's revealed. The secret things belong to him. And basically what we find is is that God has revealed to us that a kingdom, a coming kingdom has been promised. And he wants us to understand that and look forward to that. So therefore, as we consider the next portion of this message. I want to just ask this question. What are we requesting? What are we asking when we pray, may your kingdom come and may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven? What is it that we're saying? What is it that we're saying? God, I I desire this. Is this something that we actually understand? And it's interesting to realize, it's important to understand, Jesus, because of the problem of sin in God's tarnished kingdom, mankind tarnished the kingdom through sin, because of that problem, our Lord Jesus Christ placed a special emphasis on praying for the kingdom to come. That should be a prayer request. We should pray for the peace of Jerusalem. We should pray, Father, may your kingdom come. May your will be done here on earth, just like it is always done in heaven. But now a little context before we consider, why do we pray that? Why do we ask that? First piece of context. Let's recognize the themes that we find in the book of Judges. God has established his kingdom, Genesis. He's established the nation of Israel in Genesis and on into Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, they're entering into the promised land through Joshua. They're getting into the promised land. Joshua failed to fulfill all that God had asked to be done in conquering the promised land. And we have the book of Judges. And Israel is basically leaderless in the book of Judges. And it's the theme of the book of Judges is twofold. There was no king in Israel, and everyone did what was right in their own eyes. No king, no leader. They felt like a headless horseman, so to speak. And they didn't understand that without a king, they were being thrust into chaos and confusion because they were not following God's authority. God wanted himself to be king, to be seen as king, to be seen as the one we follow God. And it says, the sons of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. That's important for us to recognize, too, about Judges. Secondly, no more context. The book of Daniel. So much there. We taught it a little over a year ago. And as we look at Daniel... Let's remember what happened. The Israelites are taken captive into Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar, the leader of the Babylonians, had taken Israel captive. And he had this man, Daniel. We know Daniel, one of the few Israel um, choice choice people from Israel that were actually placed into into positions of leadership. God did this for Daniel, for Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael, or Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, as we better know them by their, their pagan names. But they were all there, and Nebuchadnezzar was the leader. And God was working in Nebuchadnezzar's life. God was working in Nebuchadnezzar and was working to draw him into an understanding of who he was. But now in Daniel chapter 4, it says, Nebuchadnezzar, while walking on the roof of the palace in Babylon, he said, 
Is this not Babylon the great, which I myself have built by the might of my power for the glory of my majesty? And it says in that passage in Daniel 4, While the word was still in the king's mouth, a voice came from heaven saying, King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is declared, sovereignty has been removed from you. Until you recognize that the Most High is ruler over the realm of mankind, and he bestows, on, he bestows it on whomever he wishes, and immediately God's word was fulfilled, and Nebuchadnezzar was sent out into the wilderness, out in the, he was eating grass with the animals. His, his rulership, his sovereignty was taken from him. Why? Because he was so welled up in pride, thinking, I, I, I. And that's context for us praying for God's kingdom because God's kingdom will remove every bit of human authority. God's kingdom will remove all human government. God's kingdom will bring a theocracy upon the world. And God will be fully in charge. God's in charge now. He's created mankind and given mankind many, many freedoms and their freedom of choice through sinfulness has put them into a position of chaos because God's authority is not recognized. Something I said last week from, from Pastor Tony Evans, something I really enjoy th thinking about, I, I, I recognize this, and that is that, that taking God seriously, do I take God Almighty seriously? Do I recognize His authority? Do I recognize who He is? Do I recognize what He says, what He does, what He wants? Taking God seriously means knowing what he says and therefore knowing what he thinks and making those things a priority for our lives, both personally and professionally. And when we fail to do that, all chaos breaks out. Chaos and confusion takes hold. And that's a difficult situation. That's the world where we live today. And the last bit of context, what I want us to see, Romans 1, verses 18 through 32. I'm not going to read that entire passage. I'm just simply going to summarize. God's wrath is revealed against people who suppress the truth. Suppress it to the truth is being suppressed every single day on the news. The truth is being suppressed in various things we hear on the radio, things we see in magazines, things we see on the internet. God's truth is being suppressed. They're making boys into girls, girls into boys. They're saying there's more than two genders. We know that's not true. They're saying the world's going to be destroyed by climate change. The Bible never indicates anything like that. God's wrath is revealed against people who suppress the truth. Professing to be, right, professing to be wise, they became fools. They exchanged the truth of God for lies and deception. And people don't see fit to acknowledge God any longer. It says in 2 Timothy chapter 3 that in the last days, in the latter times, difficult things are going to take place. People are going to rebel against family. People are going to rebel against authority. People are going to make right wrong and wrong right. And all those things are taking place. And because of that, Jesus says to us, pray your kingdom come, may your will be done here on earth just like it is in heaven. Why? Because God's perfect will is not being fulfilled, or actually fulfilled is the wrong word. God's perfect will is not being carried out by people the way it should be. People don't take God seriously. So with all those things in mind, the three things that we're asking when we pray, Father, may your kingdom come, may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Number one, it is a prayer for spiritual renewal. It is a prayer for people to, to experience changed lives through the power of the Holy Spirit through the precious blood of Jesus Christ who died on the cross to pay the penalty for their sins, 
for people who experience conversion to become followers of Christ rather than followers of their own desires. And it's important for us to realize as we pray, your kingdom come, we're asking for the, for the gospel to go out and affect people's lives. And what has to happen for that to take place? We need to be willing to be God's representatives to share the good news with other people. We need to be concerned about those in our lives that we know that are lost, that have never trusted in Christ, that maybe are just literally resisting or rejecting Jesus Christ. We need to talk to them. We need to ask them, do you want to consider this? Do you realize what eternity means? Do you realize what God's kingdom is all about? And we are praying, when your kingdom come, we're praying for changed lives, for spiritual renewal. Renewal. We're praying for conversion, for people to become followers of Jesus Christ. And in order to be part of God's kingdom, we said this last week, we'll say it again today, we'll say it most every week in a certain fashion. If a person fails to trust Christ as the Lord and Savior who died on the cross for their sins, they are not part of God's kingdom. They are not going to go to heaven and they're going to face eternal condemnation. And that isn't a joke. That is not something to laugh about. I hear people saying, well, hey, all my friends are going to hell. I might as well go there too. When they say that, they have no idea of what they're really saying. They have no concept of what it means to resist and reject God's gracious goodness and provision through Jesus Christ. And it's important this Jesus says, pray for conversions. Pray for your, your, your kingdom come. The only way the kingdom comes is for people is that they trust in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. We're praying for changed lives. Every genuinely authentic follower of Christ is a member of God's kingdom. And they are the only members of God's kingdom. But now secondly... Not just praying for spiritual renewal, for changed lives, for conversions. Really, we're praying for spiritual submission. May your kingdom come. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We're praying that our lives would be obedient lifestyles. That we would look into God's word and see, these are things God tells me to do. God tells me to trust in him with all my heart and not to lean on my own understanding, not to become wise in my own eyes, not to begin thinking, well, I know better than God knows, or I know better than what God's word says, or I know better than what the pastor says or what some other Christian leader says. Whenever we are thinking we know better than what God's word tells us to do, or we have a better idea, you know, Ford had a better idea, they say, that old, old commercial. Well, if they had a better idea, that's interesting, but yet God's idea is the only good idea. And we need to recognize that we're praying for spiritual submission, that I would follow God's guidelines, that I would obey his commands, that I would look at his instructions and see what they tell me. So many people don't even know what God's in instructed them to do. So many people fail to look deeply into God's Word and see the things that are in, you know, instructed, see the things that are directed, see the things that are provided as guidelines for our lives. When it says, speak truth to your, to your neighbor, that means speak the gospel, yes. That means speak honestly. That means speak caringly. When it says that we ought to respect one another, that we ought to respect each other. I, I heard a message from Tony Evans again this week, hearing him speak about how so many Christians, they get upset with one another over things that are absolutely ridiculous. Or sometimes they get upset with one another in, for reasons that are literally not right according to God's Word. And I think it's key that we understand that we're praying for obedient lifestyles, and we're thinking 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, but sanctify Christ as Lord of your hearts, being ready always to give an answer to those that ask, why are you hopeful? Why are you faithful? 
Why are you following Jesus Christ? Why do you say no to things that you think are not necessarily healthy or proper or spiritually good for you to do? Why do you do that? Am I ready to explain that to people? Am I ready to talk to people in a counseling, encouraging way? People who sanctify Christ as Lord of, our, of, of their hearts, they are people who take God seriously. They are people who serve God faithfully. They are people that are more interested in what God wants than what they want themselves. And I realize we all have wants, we all have wishes. But sometimes our wants and wishes, they are not necessarily needs. And we get so involved in thinking, well, if I only had this, if I could do this, if I could do that, and we're failing to see how God's will needs to be carried out by our lives and our lifestyles. So I ask this simple question, do people around me see a life filled with hope? Do people around me see a life driven by the control of the Holy Spirit? Because as we pray, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. May your kingdom come. We're praying for spiritual submission. But then finally, we're praying for the Lord's return. We're looking forward to Christ to return. And we're thinking that we need to realize first he comes to rescue believers from the wrath that will invade the world once the tribulation begins. When the rapture takes place, there will not be one Christian left on this earth. There may be people who will come to faith shortly thereafter, but once the rapture takes all the followers of Christ away from this earth, there won't be one Christian here. And wrath is going to begin. Wrath is going to begin to develop and invade this world like it's never invaded it before. It's going to be the worst time ever. Nothing in the previous past, nothing in history will compare to it. And I stop and think, I have loved ones that are going to be here there if they don't trust Christ. I'm praying for the Lord's return, and first he's going to rescue those of us that have trusted Christ. He's going to take those people from the graves first that have trusted Christ, then the rest of us will follow. And then Christ comes a second time, the first time when the rapture, he never sets foot on earth. We meet him in the clouds. But the second time, he comes to set up his kingdom on earth. And at that point, he will commit many people to the lake of fire. He will condemn many people. He will judge many people. And when he sets up his kingdom, that's going to be a glorious time because the millennial kingdom will be a time of peace. But we need to realize that in God's kingdom, there will be no human rule or government God will rule with Christ on the throne in Jerusalem. And then after the millennium, after the thousand years, Jesus will reign on the throne in the new Jerusalem. And when we pray for the Lord's return, we realize that that is the consummation. That's Revelation 21 and 22, all being carried out, all being expressed. And at that point in time, history is completed, so to speak, in the fact of what, what sinfulness has done to the world. All sinners are going to be condemned. All sinners are going to be in the lake of fire. All unrepentant, un, unredeemed sinners. And as we look at this world, are we committed to the gospel? Are we committed to sharing Christ? Are we committed to making a difference with our lives and our lifestyles? And as I say that, just finally, four applications, very brief, but very important. Number one, because of the problem of sin all around us, in my own life, in your life too, because of that problem of sin, our Lord Jesus Christ placed an emphasis on us praying for his kingdom to come. Jesus wants to put an end to sin. Jesus wants to put an end to the, the corruption and the chaos in this world. He wants to put an end to it. There's going to be more chaos once Christ returns to snatch us up and then the tribulation and all that, yes. But ultimately, what God is doing, he's putting an end to all unrighteousness. 
and he asks us to pray for his kingdom to come. Secondly, God's kingdom was initially established when, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. God's kingdom is everlasting. God rules and reigns today. And I am accountable before God, my creator. You are accountable before God, your creator. And that kingdom that God established, we look at the kingdom and there's all these different opinions, all these different thoughts. We should cast all those different ideas that, 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 that others have about, well, his kingdom, it, it's, it's, it's just in heaven. Or his kingdom is just spiritual. His kingdom is never going to be physical. We need to realize his kingdom today is physical. Because he established the kingdom when he created this world. And he established the fact that he was the authority. And every person that lives will live in, a, in, in, in accountability before God Almighty, their judge. And the kingdom exists today because God, he rules and he reigns. And we can't ignore that fact. God has the right to judge. He has the right to hold us accountable. And we should recognize that. Thirdly, whenever people fail to acknowledge God's authority, when they think, well, I'm in charge, like Nebuchadnezzar, or like the Israelites when they said, there's no king in Israel, there's nobody in charge, we can do whatever we want to do. You know, when the cat's away, the mice will play, so to speak. Whenever people fail to acknowledge God's authority, fail to acknowledge that we're accountable to God's authority, there's going to be an experience of chaos from the curse, confusion from the curse that is in this world. When mankind sinned, God placed a curse over the world, or a curse fell upon the world. And when people fail to realize God's authority, that curse becomes even more prominent. That chaos and confusion becomes even more difficult. When it says in Proverbs 3, verses 5, 6, 7, and 8, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not lean on your own perception, your own understanding, your own knowledge. Acknowledge Him in all your ways. Acknowledge His authority in everything you do. And then He gives you the guidance. He directs your path. But He warns us, don't be wise in our own eyes thinking, I know the way. I know the right. Because without God's help, without God's authority leading us, our, our perspective of what's right and wrong becomes tainted. And then finally... God's kingdom is an essential theme in his word. People downplay it. I read a church doctrinal statement a couple weeks ago where not one thing was said about God's kingdom. And that's difficult for me to in, in, in envision that why do people ignore God's kingdom? Why do people ignore God's plan for the ages? Why do people fail to recognize that God established a kingdom in Genesis 1 and he still is in charge of that kingdom even today? And we need to realize that God's kingdom is an essential theme in the word. So therefore, we should pray for God's kingdom because God looks forward to the day when he will establish his ultimate rule and reign where sin will no longer exist, where unrighteousness will no longer be a temptation where we will be committed completely and exclusively to following God Almighty and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. God's kingdom is essential for us to understand and recognize. Hey, thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. Let me pray as I close. Father, I ask that you'd help as just I consider the, uh, the needs that are out there. I think of different individuals that are looking at uh, medical decisions, I pray for wisdom. I pray for your provisions. I pray for your protection in these individuals' lives. I pray for good success in whatever medical treatments they get. I pray for those that are going on hospice now. My aunt, Lori Pankow. I pray for what's best in these situations. I pray your will be done, Father, and your word to be uh, an encouragement to everyone, the word that you've provided for us in wondrous ways. 
I pray for our country, for our president, for his administration. I pray for what's going on in, in, in the House of Representatives, in the Senate. I pray for the elections coming up in just a, it's about three weeks, Father. I pray for those elections because they are very important. And I pray that people will vote their biblically inspired conscience, their spiritually and biblically inspired conscience. They'll vote according to what your word says, Father. I pray that. I know your plans and purposes for this world are carried out through things like elections. And I realize, Father, that you have a perfect plan that ultimately will bring about your kingdom. So I pray that your kingdom come and your will be done here on earth, just like it always is in heaven. Father, thank you for Jesus Christ. Thank you that he died a death on the cross for my sins and for every sin of every person that's listening to this video. Every person around me, Jesus Christ died to pay the punishment. And I recognize that his death was sufficient. And I praise you for it. I thank you for it. And I ask now, Father, that as we close this time, that you might strengthen our lives spiritually, emotionally, and physically. You might help us to be faithful to you in every aspect. And that we might sense encouragement in all that we say and do, Father, in all that you do for us. Thank you. We love you, we praise you, and we ask you all in Jesus' wondrous, powerful name. And all God's people said, amen. Well, hey, why, thanks for watching. Thanks for being part. And again, look forward to uh, hearing from you. Look forward to seeing you when I can. And um, I appreciate your prayers for me too, and for, for just our church and for our staff and for everyone. Thank you for praying. Thanks for being part. Lord bless.